This week on Spiritual Awakening Radio, I explore vegetarianism in Christianity and then in Buddhism. It's time for Spiritual Awakening Radio. There's not just one religion. There are thousands. After years of being concerned that too few voices, too few points of view, were getting heard when it comes to spiritual paths and world religions, that the radio airwaves were not reflecting the diversity that really exists, I started producing my own programs, exploring the world of spirituality, comparative religion, meditation, mysticism, vegetarianism, the vegan diet, ahimsa, and peace, education for a more peaceful world, exploring books and bringing to the airwaves the gentle voices of saints, the wisdom of masters or mystics, world scriptures, sacred texts, the great spiritual traditions and classics of the East and the West. My name is James Bean. Welcome to Spiritual Awakening Radio. I'm noticing that people sometimes find very liberating, very inspiring this information about Jesus and the early Christians actually being vegetarians, the family of Jesus, the inner circle of disciples, the first apostles. They find that very liberating. I've had interviews by television stations, I've had magazines publish my articles that I've been writing in in the last year on this question. And I suppose uh, the idea of a meat-eating Messiah would be very oppressive when it comes to the question of vegetarianism for some. If Jesus the Messiah ate meat, go back to sleep, everyone. Who cares? It's a moot point. If you can be Messiah and eat meat, well... What's the virtue of being vegetarian, right? But at the very beginning of Christianity, we find evidence for vegetarianism. In fact, the Apostle Paul in the New Testament itself is arguing with vegetarian disciples of Christ. So this information is not new information. It's actually very old information. And the powers that be haven't valued it, haven't quoted it, so most people haven't heard of it. And so it seems new, but it's been with us the entire time, these vegetarian gospels and old writings and early church fathers and historians, a historic record mentioning this information. It's not new. It's very, very old. And it goes back to the Aramaic roots of early Christianity, the Hebrew Christians. Before the Roman Christians, there were the Jewish Christians. Jesus, after all, was Jewish. Uncovering a vegetarian Jesus at the beginning of Christianity. During the first century A.D., the Essenes were one of the three main branches of Judaism. They were opposed to animal sacrifices being made in the Jewish temple, and they were also known to be vegetarians. The Essenes were the group that Jesus and the first Christians, the Ebionites, were closest to, sharing with them many of the same values and sacred texts, such as the books of Enoch. Unlike the Sadducees and Pharisees, the Essenes are never criticized in the New Testament. The following is a vegetarian saying of Jesus in the New Testament that is from the Aramaic, the Syriac Aramaic manuscript that has a vegetarian twist to it. In the Greek edition of the New Testament that's been popular in and, and emanates from Roman circles, The vegetarian part is omitted, but in the Syriac East, where vegetarianism is more popular, it's there. And it turns out that in many world religions, you have 
sacred texts that support meat eating, and you have sacred texts that support vegetarianism. In Buddhism, the pro-meat sutras are read by, no surprise, the pro-meat denominations or branches of Buddhism. And in early Christianity, we see the very same thing. There are vegetarian gospels read by, surprise, surprise, vegetarian Christians, and pro-meat, pro-Rome, Roman Empire diet being reflected in books that are valued as sacred texts read by Christians in the Roman Empire supporting the pro-meat position, but also vegetarian Gospels read by vegetarian Christians. This is from Luke chapter 21, verse 34, from the Syriac Aramaic New Testament. Now beware in yourselves that your hearts do not become heavy with the eating of flesh and with the intoxication of wine and with the anxiety of the world and that they come upon you suddenly. For as a snare, it will come upon all those that dwell upon the surface of the earth. Like the Essenes, Jesus, his family, and the original followers, the first Christians, the first followers, part of the Jesus movement, were vegetarians and opposed to all sacrifice of animals in the Jewish temple. This is a saying of Jesus, very similar to the one in the Syriac Aramaic version of Luke 21, but it's from something called the Gospel of the Hebrews. I am come to do away with sacrifices, and if you cease not sacrificing, the wrath of God will not cease from you. So very similar, uh, extra canonical or apocryphal saying of Jesus from the Gospel of the Hebrews, and the one from the Syriac New Testament, both are pro-vegetarian. According to the Gospel of the Ebionites, Jesus also rejected the Passover meal and said that he had no desire to eat the Paschal lamb, which is a Jewish tradition. Jesus had a brother. He's referred to by scholars and historians as James the Just, or James the Righteous. According to a wide variety of sources, James became Jesus' spiritual successor, the next leader of this original group referred to as the Hebrew Christians, the Aramaic Christians, or the Ebionites, the original community. The well-known Dead Sea Scrolls scholar Robert Eisenman wrote a 1,000-page book about James the Just, the brother of Jesus, called James the Just, The Key to Unlocking the Secrets of Early Christianity in the Dead Sea Scrolls. That's a great book. The first words on the back cover of this book are, James was a vegetarian, quote, unquote, and describes him as very Essene-like, uh, immersing himself in water, i.e., a ritual of baptism every morning, which is also a seat custom, by the way. I just thought I would toss that in there. James the Just became the successor of Christ, the next leader of this Jesus movement based in Jerusalem. The Gospel of Thomas, saying 12, says, The disciples said to Christ, We are aware you will depart from us. Who will be our leader? Jesus said to him, No matter where you Come, it is to James the Just that you shall go, for whose sake heaven and earth came to exist. And this is from an early church historian. James, the brother of the Lord, lived on seeds and plants and touched neither meat nor wine. Keith Akers makes some great observations in his article, Was Jesus a Vegetarian? Eusebius the church historian says James, the brother of Jesus, was a vegetarian and, in fact, was evidently raised as a vegetarian from, from birth, from the womb. Why would Jesus' parents have raised James the Just as a vegetarian unless they were vegetarians themselves and raised Jesus as a vegetarian as well? I think that's a very logical point. Have you ever heard of a family that says, 
my our older son will be vegetarian, but the younger one will eat meat, and we eat meat, but we want him to be vegetarian. Does does that make sense? No, it doesn't, does it? Why would one son be vegetarian but the other not? And what family would would have a desire to have one of their sons be vegetarian if they had no uh, interest in being vegetarian themselves. The disciples became vegetarians. In his church history text, Eusebius wrote that the Apostle John never ate meat, quote, unquote. The early church father Clement of Alexandria, who was also a vegetarian, wrote about the Apostle Matthew, saying, It is far better to be happy than to have your bodies act as graveyards for animals. Accordingly, the Apostle Matthew partook of seeds, nuts, and vegetables without flesh, unquote. Actually, there's been some great medical studies uh, in recent years about how great it is to have nuts in your diet, especially walnuts, which are very high in omega-3 fatty acids. So, yes, I think Matthew, the apostle, an author of the, allegedly the author of the Gospel of Matthew, was on to something there with uh, seeds and nuts. Peter, described by some as the first pope, said, quote, I live on olives and bread, to which I rarely only add vegetables, unquote. That's a passage from the Clementine homilies, an Ebionite gospel, a vegetarian gospel, used by the early Christians. What about the fishes and the loaves reference? That's the first question people always uh, ask when it comes to talking about vegetarianism in early Christianity. The original version of the feeding of the multitude miracle story only refers to bread, not bread and fish. Fish seems to have been added later, was not referred to by the earliest church fathers. They didn't describe it as a miracle of fish and bread, but just the miracle of bread being created and fed to this multitude. In the Gospel of the Hebrews, which was sacred to early Christian groups such as the Ebionites, Jesus, John the Baptist as well, are portrayed as vegetarians. The Ebionites as well as other Christian groups were themselves vegetarians. The Ebionites accepted only the Gospel of the Hebrews as authentic and believed that this Gospel was the original Gospel of Matthew, the so-called Hebrew version of the Gospel of Matthew. In December 1945, a collection of ancient scriptures, 52 books, was unearthed near the village of Nag Hammadi in Upper Egypt, near the Nile. These texts had been placed in a clay storage jar, sealed and buried sometime during the 4th century. Monks who lived at a nearby monastery founded by St. Pacomius most likely hid them there at the time. They would have been sacred texts once part of the St. Pacomius monastic library of this community, one of several Pacomian monasteries operating in Egypt during the 4th century. Actually, even to this very day, uh, most monastics, most monasteries, including Catholic and Orthodox monasteries, most mostly uh, serve vegetarian food, uh, even now. Rather than confining themselves to only reading the Old and New Testaments or teachings exclusively from Orthodox Christian sources, these monks had some interesting books they were reading. They had some interesting books in their library. They had a surprisingly diverse collection of writings that only can be characterized as interfaith and multi-traditional. They were reading some scriptures from other religions, not just from their own, which is quite Amazing. It would be like someone reading Buddhist sutras and Upanishads today. That would be my library. That would be, we have uh, more stuff to look at these days. But they were doing quite well. Uh, think of the remote location in Upper Egypt in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and no Internet and uh, no movable type. Monks would just copy books by hand one at a time. They were doing rather well. 
The papyrus codices of the Nag Hammadi scriptures include Christian texts, such as the Gospel of Thomas and several books of James the Just and the Gospel of Mary Magdalene. There are also examples of mystical or Gnostic Jewish texts similar to Kabbalah in the Nag Hammadi collection. And there is a book called The Sentences of Sexus, the Pythagorean, included in the Nag Hammadi that these, book, these monks were studying, one of the books of their library. The Pythagoreans were, as the name suggests, followers of Pythagoras, a sect that believed in a fascinating combination of mathematics and mystical beliefs and practices, including reincarnation, transmigration of the soul, and hearing the music of the spheres, the harmony of all harmonies. They also adhered to a vegetarian diet. In fact, for most of the last 2,000 years in our Western world, the word vegetarian has been synonymous with Pythagorean. Such was their influence on pagan Jewish and Christian traditions. Vegetarians have been referred to as Pythagoreans up until recently when the word vegetarian became fairly popular. I learned that actually from talking to Dr. Will Tuttle, author of The World Peace Diet. He pointed out that the old name for vegetarians is Pythagoreans. And I thought, aha, the sentences of Sextus and that early sect, a group of mathematical mystics known as the Pythagoreans. Yes, that's right. So here we have uh, examples of vegetarians in early Christianity. We have vegetarian sayings of Jesus. We have references uh, from historians that are actually recognized by Catholic and Orthodox uh, leadership as legit, talking about early apostles being vegetarians. And I should point out also that um, there's a strange reference in the New Testament to John the Baptist eating locusts, and that apparently is a mistranslation. It should read carob bean, which has a very similar spelling, apparently, in Greek. And so rather than John the Baptist, the bug eater, it sh he should be understood as John the Baptist, the carob bean eater. And uh, that was a source of protein. The carob tree is also known as the locust tree or St. John's tree, is uh, something that grows in the Middle East. And you can grind these up, and it also it almost makes a kind of a cocoa if you if you put it in in juice form, uh, or make uh, tea with it, or you know, it's kind of like a like a substitute for for chocolate. It's very similar to chocolate if you do that. In fact, people that uh, enjoy the taste of chocolate but want to avoid caffeine from chocolate will drink carob powder or make uh, make a hot drink out of carob powder. Not ground up locusts, but the, the locust bean, which grows in the Middle East. And so there's some information about vegetarianism in Christianity. I want to read to you, to conclude this section on Christianity and vegetarianism, a passage actually comes from India by Sant Darshan Singh, a poet mystic. All living creatures seek to live in peace with humanness pass your days on this earth. Even the heart that beats in the breast of a beast has sympathy and love. So cast a look of loving compassion on all animals and bring a new dawn to humanity's night. When we talk about being compassionate toward animals, that it's not ethical to eat animals, to kill animals, to torture animals. It's not just about abstaining from meat, going without. Really, this is a very holistic sort of approach that is compassionate not only for the animals, 
but also for human beings too. If our arteries aren't clogging up so quickly, we'll live longer, avoid diseases, and have more opportunity to make spiritual progress, have a little longer lifespan, spend more time in meditation. And so those who argue in favor of animal rights and not eating animals, they are saying, let's reduce suffering in the world for everyone. You're hearing Spiritual Awakening Radio. Stay tuned for more. After the break, I will delve into Buddhism and vegetarianism. Stay tuned. All living creatures seek to live in peace. With humanness, pass your days on this earth. Even the heart that beats in the breast of a beast has sympathy and love. So cast a look of loving compassion on all animals and bring a new dawn to humanity's night. Darshan Singh from a book called Path of Light or Jada E. Noor, a very Sufi sounding title. Vegetarianism in Buddhism on the rest of this week's edition of Spiritual Awakening Radio. At first, when I approached the subject, I thought, wow, I'll at least get four or five Buddhist quotes, four or five sentences, but I'm not sure how much beyond that. But to my pleasant surprise, in a very short period of time, I came up with over 8,000 words, and I haven't even scratched the surface yet. There's enough material on Buddhism and vegetarianism and veganism for someone to actually produce an entire radio show, have guests review books all about vegetarianism and Buddhism. If someone wants to do that, they would have a lot of material to work with. So it seems. The Buddha said, the eating of meat extinguishes the seed of great compassion. And the seed of great compassion is another way of saying Buddha nature, the true essence. One who eats meat kills the seed of great compassion is another way of translating that from the Nirvana Sutra. From the Lanka Vatara Sutra, all the saints condemned eating blood or flesh. Celestial beings never go near people who eat meat, as their mouth always has a foul smell. Meat is not good. Meat is unclean. Meat eating generates evils and destroys merits and blessings. All the saints denounce eating meat. At some places, I forbade people to eat ten kinds of meat and allowed them to eat three kinds of pure meat so as to help them quit meat eating gradually and subsequently embark on spiritual practice. Now I say I forbid all meat eating regardless of whether the animal dies naturally or is killed. I have never allowed my disciples to eat meat and I will not allow in the present or future. That's a quote from the Buddha. All sentient beings came from the same origin. Through many incarnations, all sentient beings have been relatives of each other. How can we eat the meat of our relatives? That's also from a Buddhist sutra. An interesting perspective. And you bring reincarnation and the transmigration of the soul into it. People who eat meat are destroying the great merciful seed of their own Buddha nature. And any sentient beings seeing them would leave them. Therefore, all bodhisattvas must refrain from eating the flesh of any sentient beings, as this will incur boundless sin. From the Srangama Sutra, it says, people who eat meat will never succeed in getting any blessing or merit that they pray for. 
Meat eaters cause the celestial beings who avoid them and other sentient beings to be afraid of them. Just interjecting here, uh, it's been my observation that most of the mystical paths, those that really advocate going within, deeply going within, having a very serious uh, meditation practice, out of body, rising above body consciousness, transcendental hearing, transcendental seeing, the ascension of the soul, heavy-duty meditation, they tend to be vegetarian, and uh, in India, for instance, they argue that eating meat makes it harder to see with your third eye. It just adds the weight of karma, a little extra karma each day to, to make it harder to progress. And so they believe uh, that uh, there is a karmic burden that makes it somewhat difficult to gain ground, to make progress, to move forward. More Buddhist quotes about vegetarian compassion in action and applying it to what's for dinner. Being a vegetarian makes it easier for us to increase our loving kindness and compassion. Every individual who eats flesh food, whether an animal is killed expressly for him or not, is supporting the trade of slaughtering and contributing to the violent deaths of harmless animals. I'm just sharing with you various quotes. Some of these are from contemporary or living authors as well as ancient sutras. So this is across the centuries, across the millennia, these quotes are from. Rather than encouraging apathy through submissive responses, let us deliver the message loudly and clearly that needless killing and suffering is wrong. That's from a Buddhist publication called Ahimsa, Buddhism and the Vegetarian Ideal. This is so rich, so much in Buddhist sources on vegetarianism. The Buddhist teachings leads us to the realization that we must always strive to harm no sentient being, human or non-human, whether or not it is in our selfish interest to do so. That's a quote from Norm Phelps from the book The Great Compassion, Buddhism and Animal Rights. Just interjecting here, I, I have read in the past uh, passages from Thich Nhat Hanh, who uh, speaks about being mindful in the present moment, Buddhist mindfulness meditation. And he is a very serious vegetarian, an advocate of animal rights, and would really like to pass laws shutting down all the slaughterhouses on the planet. So he, he is very, very strict, very, very strong in his views on vegetarianism and is a very famous Buddhist spiritual teacher. Buddhism and Vegetarianism and the Vegan Diet. This week on Spiritual Awakening Radio. Stay tuned for more after these messages. Spiritual Awakening Radio is heard every week at this time. My name is James Bean. My website is spiritualawakeningradio.com. Send me an email message if you like. James at spiritualawakeningradio.com is my email address, james at spiritualawakeningradio.com. I can send you my articles on Christianity and vegetarianism, and I can send you this long list of Buddhist vegetarian quotes I'm sharing on today's program. Just email me at james at spiritualawakeningradio.com, and I'll happily do that. <laughs> More quotes. We have to turn back to our caring and compassionate nature inside our heart. That's very simple. We are that. We are compassion. We are merciful. We are caring. If we truly wish to see real harmony born between humans and animals and nature and heaven, we must be the harmony. We must live in harmony and act also in harmony, which includes the act of eating harmoniously each time we come to the table. 
Making a vegan choice is thus a true advancement in the evolution and goodness of our humanity. And then we also know that like attracts like. Goodness attracts more goodness. As we share this compassionate truth with others, not only will our own humanity be further uplifted, so will the world's. That's a quote from Supreme Master Ching Hai's book, From Crisis to Peace, The Organic Vegan Way is the Answer, which is a book all about the vegan diet and compassion, compassion on the animals, compassion on our arteries and avoiding diseases, which causes humans to suffer, and compassion upon the arteries of the earth itself. Uh, and uh, climate change and methane in the atmosphere and global warming and so on. Crisis2peace.org, crisis, C-R-I-S-I-S, number two, P-E-A-C-E dot org, and you can read that book for free online. This week I'm sharing with you quotes from the Buddhist East on vegetarianism and the vegan diet. The Buddha said in the, if I'm pronouncing this somewhat correctly, Maha Parinirvana Sutra, the Great Nirvana Sutra, the eating of meat extinguishes the seed of great compassion. Ultimately, the case for shining animal flesh does not rest on what the Buddha allegedly said or didn't say. What it does rest on is our innate moral goodness, compassion, and pity, which, when liberated, lead us to value all forms of life. It is obvious, then, that willfully to take life or, through the eating of meat indirectly, to cause others to kill runs counter to the deepest instincts of human beings. That's from a Buddhist book called To Cherish All Life. There are three ways of killing that we as Buddhists have to restrain, either by directly killing, indirectly killing, or rejoicing to see others be killed. Not only does this apply to human life, it should also be extended to all living beings. I don't see much room for a death penalty there, as well as meat eating. That's from the book Buddhism for Beginners. Such a treasure trove of, of quotes I found. Send me an email and I will send you all of these quotes I'm sharing on today's program. Buddhism and vegetarianism, the Buddhist view of vegetarianism. From time to time on this program, I do programs on the vegetarian diet or vegan diet, and one of these days will be a program on vegetarianism and the Baha'i faith or vegetarianism and Sikhism. I was collecting a huge amount of quotes from the Sikh religion uh, recently and putting it on one page of my website. And so... Uh, over time, I will do programs covering all religions, uh, vegetarianism and Kabbalah, or the Jewish tradition. Uh, it turns up everywhere in all of the great world religions, more and more as humanity evolves. This is from the book Ahimsa, Buddhism and the Vegetarian Ideal. The eating of meat cannot in any way be considered to be helpful to the practice of the Dharma. Neither can the slaughter of animals be considered to be consistent with the Buddhist teachings of compassion, metta, ahimsa, or karuna, of loving kindness, or the nature of the evocation of the enlightenment mind. The cruelties associated with the slaughter of the animal kingdom for human consumption, the pain, fear, and distress suffered by the animals in the entire process of being fattened for butchering, as well as the environmental disasters wreaked upon our planet through the meat industry, are very well documented and should be understood by all who claim to be developing bodhicitta, 
or wish to. That's from the book Ahimsa, Buddhism and the Vegetarian Ideal. Bodhicitta, I don't claim to be fluent in Buddhism, but uh, it refers to the enlightened consciousness or the part of the mind able to tap into enlightened mind, Bodhi Chitta. So that is absolutely fascinating. Meat eating and a compassionate religion do not go hand in hand. Also a quote from Ahimsa, Buddhism and the vegetarian ideal. The word Ahimsa is used by many these days. It has its origins in Jainism and Hinduism. Lord Mahavira of Jainism. Uh, it's a term which is sort of an Eastern equivalent to the Golden Rule. It means nonviolence in thought, word, and deed. And of course, deed also includes in the area of diet, spirituality affecting what's for dinner or lunch or breakfast. More Buddhist quotes on being vegan and vegetarian. After the break, you're hearing Spiritual Awakening Radio, exploring the world of spirituality and comparative religion, Buddhism and vegetarian diet on this week's program. Stay tuned. From time to time on Spiritual Awakening Radio, I do programs exploring the vegan diet and vegetarian diet in the world religions. One of these days I'll do a program on Sikhism and the vegetarian diet, Kabbalah and the vegetarian diet, the Baha'i Faith, Native American. Over time, I will cover all of the world religions, East and West. If you'd like to receive a copy of my article on Christianity and the vegetarian diet, as well as a copy of this long list of Buddhist vegetarian quotes I'm sharing on today's program, I can send them to you. There are so many. I've got 8,000 words in front of me here. I know I won't really cover them all on this one program, but I can send them to you in email form. Send me an email at this address, james at spiritualawakeningradio.com. Across my collection of vegetarian quotes from Christian and Buddhist sources, I'm sharing on today's program, james at spiritualawakeningradio.com. The following is from the book, Food of Bodhisattvas, Buddhist Teachings on Abstaining from Meat. One of the greatest obstacles to the birth of bodhicitta in our minds is our craving for meat. Bodhicitta, enlightenment, as in bodhi tree, or bodhi, and chitta, which relates to consciousness, interfacing with the mind. If there is no meat eater, there will be no animal killer. That's a passage from the same book, Food of Bodhisattvas, Buddhist teachings on abstaining from meat. Less methane in the atmosphere, less cholesterol, and antibiotics flowing through people's bloodstreams as well. More rainforest land, etc., etc., more quotes from Buddhist sources. To put the flesh of an animal into one's belly makes one an accessory after the fact of its slaughter. Simply because if cows, pigs, sheep, fowl, and fish, to mention the most common, were not eaten, they would not be killed. That's a quote from To Cherish All Life. This one comes from the book Bodhipaksa on Buddhist vegetarianism. We can do no greater harm than to kill another sentient being. Killing is the ultimate expression of indifference to the well-being of others. All except the most extreme circumstances, all except in the most extreme circumstances, cherish life. In the contemporary hell of the modern slaughterhouse, Animals cry out and cower in terror when they realize that their life is nearing a premature end. All beings, except in the most desperate circumstances, try to escape death. 
a passage from Bodhi Paksa. This is from the Dhammapada of the Buddha, from the Max Muller translation of the Dhammapada. Max Muller was a great English translator of Eastern scriptures. In fact, many of them appeared in the English language for the first time as a result of his translation work. He translated Upanishads, other Hindu scriptures, and of course the Dhammapada of the Buddha, who said, One is not a great one because one defeats or harms other beings. One is so called because one refrains from defeating or harming other living beings. Another word about a word, the word ahimsa. As I mentioned, ahimsa is the Eastern equivalent to the golden rule. It means nonviolence in thought, word, as well as deed. It's not just getting caught or the deed or even what's said. It's the thought. Thoughts are like seeds that sprout into words and deeds. And that's also a principle found in the New Testament, in the Sermon on the Mount. It's not just what you get caught doing. It's not just the doing, but also uh, the thought. The thought in one's heart or in one's mind. That is the origin of the word and the deed. Ahimsa is a term used in Buddhism. It's used in Hinduism and has its origin in Jainism. Uh, who was uh, that which was uh, brought upon India in a major sort of way as a major world religion by Lord Mahavira, who lived slightly before the time of the Buddha over 2,000 years ago in India. Ahimsa is a Jain word, and Jainism has given the world the gift of an incredible vast treasure trove of ethical wisdom in the form of Jain sutras, which govern thoughts, words, and deeds rather well. Uh, A great ethical religion that has contributed much to the future of the world by getting human beings to examine themselves, to examine their thoughts, words, and deeds, and go in the direction of nonviolence and compassion. Adhering to the five precepts, one of those being, do not kill others. The Buddha said time and time again in the sutras, such things as, my followers should give up all evil actions that directly or indirectly injure others. One may disregard his words, one may consciously lead others to commit evil in provisioning oneself with meat. One may think, There are always skillful means in the sutras and tantras that counteract the evil, so I shall still be pure of stain, unquote. And one can let oneself off the hook by telling oneself that there are substances to be placed into the animals' mouths and words that can be uttered or whispered or chanted in their ears and impressed upon their minds so that they will not remain in the lower realms. But to do all of these reveals a complete failure to grasp the meaning of the Buddha's teachings. It is a perversion of the Dharma. So, yeah, no magical way to let oneself off the hook. Well, I just barely scratched the surface of all of these Buddhist passages on vegetarianism. Great sharing them. A lot of wisdom here. Send me an email, and I will send you this very lengthy list of Buddhist quotes on the vegetarian diet. Spiritual Awakening Radio is heard every Tuesday at 3 p.m. Eastern, which is noon Pacific time. Also on Sundays at noon Eastern, which is 9 a.m. Pacific time. At HealthyLife.net, click on the Archive tab, scroll down, and you'll discover that there are many editions of Spiritual Awakening Radio there that you can click on and listen to anytime on demand. There are also podcasts of the program available through HealthyLife.net. Visit my website, SpiritualAwakeningRadio.com. From there, you can send me an email if you like. 
And at Facebook, the address is facebook.com forward slash spiritual awakening radio, where you'll find links to recently archived programs, spiritual quotes, and news about upcoming shows. For Spiritual Awakening, I'm James Bean. 